You are listening to the North American Kings podcast, your traditional masculinity training ground. I'm your host, Glenn Kowalski, founder of North American Kings LLC, a leadership development company based in Cincinnati, Ohio. As we all know, the man brand has taken an absolute beating over the past few decades, and it's our mission to change that. We're going to do that by helping you join the fight to reclaim traditional masculine values. Welcome to headquarters. Training starts now. Welcome back to the training ground, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Glenn Kowalski. Today, we are going to dive into some current events because there's never been enough time to discuss in real terms just how much your manhood can be tested at any time. We're going to talk about principles, what it means to f- when we forsake them, and how to move forward if that decision is the one that you end up making. It's going to be a very insightful episode today, so let's get started. I'm going to start out by thanking our sponsors, Naked Armor Racers and Wet Shave Gear, for their continued support of the show. I've got to admit, I talk about shaving a lot. Now, with a beard like this and a bald head like mine, it comes up more often than it does for most other guys. Now, when I tell people I shave with a straight razor, I always get the same response. I don't think I could ever do that. Well, and it always leaves me with the, with the question, why not? People fear what they don't know. Forget the benefits of the smoothest shave you'll ever get or the lack of irritation you'll get afterwards. People hoard their courage for times when they think they'll need it, often saving more than they'll ever end up needing at any given time. Spend some courage once and invest in a well-groomed look and the looks of respect that you'll get from your friends and family when they find out that you're more courageous than them every time you shave. Now, don't forget to collect your 15% discount by using coupon code KINGS15 when you check out at NakedArmorAzers.com. Go there now, get your discount, and start enjoying the best shave you'll ever give yourself. NakedArmorAzers.com. Now, before we jump in, I'd like to take a second to give a shout out to Brother Scott for the birth of his son, Simon. This man's journey could, by anybody's standards, be one of warning or one of great desirable envy, right? Brother Scott, through everything, he has made himself a great life with his new wife, and his reward for his hard work is a healthy baby boy, his firstborn son. Congratulations, brother, and welcome to the club. So, it's been a few weeks since we've recorded, and I've got to say, does manhood get tested or what? Ugh. I mean, dang. Like, tests and challenges to your principles is precisely what, I mean, that's what makes them principles. Values untested aren't values at all. Values and principles aren't something that should easily be dropped, and they shouldn't be something that that you even could drop if you wanted them, or if you wanted to. And neither can character traits. So from, from that, you know, like, th- that builds up who we are. Now, I swear, my principles have been challenged and strained since I last sat down in front of this mic. The breadth of tests lately has been more than I usually see. And given the nature of this program, I'm usually pretty tactically aware of when these things happen. And it's a, and it's not just been big things. It's been big and small things from globalized principles to character traits about my very soul uh, to the small things that even that seem even petty. Right? Like, why take a stand on these things? But caving on principle will ultimately hurt you. That's the message today. If you stop listening now, I, I hope you don't, but that's that's the message, right? I don't mean in the macro sense, like the future of manhood is at stake. I mean, it, it, it kind of is, but I mean that you personally will hurt in your soul. The, the weight of you forsaking yourself, your your character traits, for, for you caving on principle, the weight of that will forever be added to your shoulders like the Titan Atlas forever in his punishment. All right, now there are ways to work through that, but I encourage you to, to hold your ground on principle as often as you can. 
Now, one of these things that hit me it was just this morning. My oldest son, little Glenn, called out to me from the living room, right? Now, he's he's playing on one of those little kid tablets that Amazon sells, like the ones that come cased in rubber so that kids can abuse them. Well, and he wants to show me something, and and he's doing he's been doing this a lot lately. I mean, he's been wanting validation from me from one thing or another. And as his father, validation from me means something completely different than the validation that he gets from mom. Like, that's my job, though. So develop and confirm to this kid that he's on the right path. So obviously, I'm in. Now, I'll go, I go over, and I look at the program that he's using. I don't know the name, but, but he was... He was giving a cheetah a makeover, right? Like, like it, it sounds weird even saying it out loud. I mean, I was a little stunned when I saw the thing, right? And it's and it's not like it's a bad thing, but but of anything that he was participating in, that was near the bottom of the list of anything I really anticipated seeing, right? Now here here it is, principles time. What do you say to your boy when you see him doing something that isn't strictly masculine? I mean, it really depends, doesn't it? I mean, believe me, my father put a stop to plenty of things. Like, hell, my mother did as well. Now, my wife's job is to protect my child's innocence. So her and I clash on this often. A lot of these small things. Now, what's wrong with a young boy giving a cute little girl cheetah a makeover? On its face, nothing at all. However, I, I'm looking to ensure that my son isn't developing neural pathways that make this type of thing okay in similar situations. So physiologically, the more we practice something, the easier those thoughts come to us. So I think A goes to B goes to C. The more I think in that type of way, your body actually develops the better links between the synapses in our brains that become fortified in a sense that allow the electricity to flow more freely freely along those paths. Okay? That's the the crux of habit building. So, quick mechanical lesson, air, fluid and electricity all flow along the path of least resistance. They all follow this. If they flow through tubes, piping, or wires, the flow will follow the path that is the easiest to travel. Right? If 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 liquid or air are flowing and they're like the tube goes from like this big to like this tiny bit, well, it that's a restriction. If if, if there's another path around that that doesn't end up choking itself the air or fluid will flow in that direction. The same thing with electricity, except you have resistors in between. There are things that resist the flow of electricity. So it, it's like a harder metal that doesn't quite conduct the way that gold or copper does. So for all intents and purposes, it's kind of the same thing, right? It, this is a law of physics. Now, our brains do this exact same thing, and it's a way of making us stronger. The problem, the detriment to this is that, you know, it's amoral, right? There's no determination made when these paths are being formed. It's just however you happen to think. The fix to this problem is to have it guided. So I said to my son, hey, you're doing a good job. Now, boom, like validation that he needs. He got it. Then I add the nuance. I added... You're doing a good job, but it's it's only for little girls and little girl cheetahs. Like makeup doesn't go on little boys or daddies. And he looked up at me when I said that last part. He smiled and he nodded like he thought it was kind of funny. Like I think I'd imagine he was seeing me in makeup, right? Which would be a funny sight. But I finished with only girls are supposed to look pretty. And which again, it made him giggle, but he gave me the affirmative of sorts. So I consider the matter closed. So it took me some contemplating before we even, I even launched in this discussion with him. Like, think about it. Is it really feminine to be putting makeup on anything? No. Now, to be putting makeup on yourself, that's not what I'm talking about. So the, the act of drawing and painting a face on somebody else. Like, I'm applying makeup to my wife. Is there anything really feminine about that? Well, no. Not at all. Right? It's an art form in some cases. No big deal. In fact... 
I'm really good at painting nails. All right. I admit that I've helped my wife do her nails a handful of times and I've always done it pretty well considering, you know, it's a benign activity. Now, if my son th starts thinking this way, that it's acceptable for everyone early, you know, he's going to have longer and an easier time of thinking that it would be appropriate for him to do right. Think about that thought path. It's a very small pivot to go from acceptable for boys to acceptable to me. Now, if we re correct behaviors earlier, we don't stop thoughts from forming. What we do encourage other ways of going about that in an earlier and more effective way, right? And, it'll, and that guided thought pattern, protecting his masculinity, will begin to self-reinforce. It'll be easier for him to follow that path. Hey, hey. I, me drawing is not a problem. Me being feminine is. And, and hopefully that stays with him for the rest of his life. Right? Now, masculine behaviors do change over time. I'm not making that argument. It does. But the roots are exactly the same. A young tree who's still growing, whose pathways are still reaching higher and higher every day, that's at risk. The vines that can ensnare, can, ensnare, can ensnare a tree that big and suffocate it. And it can snake down and destroy the roots as well. A giant oak who's been there for centuries or, or decades even, you know, that tree's, I mean, that tree might have a vine problem, but still it's not gonna, it's not gonna destroy the whole thing, right? You guys see the analogy here. And men, do not get me wrong. Okay, let's go back to this. We can still... We still have to remain attractive, right? That's not what I'm getting at. Girls are meant to be pretty, to catch our eye. Men, on the other hand, we need to be attractive, but how we do that is by being capable. That requires a lot less in the sense of physical beauty and far more in physical capacity. You know, if you're physically pretty, but can't provide for a woman, she won't have a reason to want you. Outside of you being a toy. And trust me, you being a toy is going to have a bigger effect on you than you think it will. Providing in the modern age is a bit different. Now, women work far more than they used to, particularly from like, they're, I mean, they're working a lot more than when we were a developing species where the function of our physiology was far more geared towards what we were, we were originally designed for. Women are providing food and shelter for themselves now. Now, what can we provide? Protection? Sure. Comfort? Absolutely. I've seen a lot of big, funny dudes that have beautiful girlfriends and wives. Okay. They provided something. There's a ton of things that we can still do to enhance a woman's life. So I'm not saying that we're not meant to make ourselves attractive. It's how we do that. It's not beauty that we're meant to provide. We men make ourselves attractive in a far more practical way. Now, when we decide to do the opposite, we sacrifice our masculinity and we're hollowing out our souls in the process. Now, we'll, I mean, we'll see, right? I think my son's on the right path for a thousand other reasons. So ultimately, I think this conversation will only end up being a benefit. I think those neural pathways are well entrenched at this point. He's asking good questions, but he's practicing the right stuff time and time over. And I couldn't be more proud of this kid. Now, I'm not demanding perfection from folks. I'm not demanding perfection from my son, uh, from other men I see. Now, my son's going to carve out his own path to masculinity. I And I hope to have some influence on that. Now, one guy who took a hard left turn on the road to masculinity is Prince Harry, former Duke of uh, Sussex, England. This dude seems to be trying oh so hard to be a beta. Now, the reason I jump in front of my son to ensure that he's carving out the right neural pathways for a fulfilling life is because I will be countered in every possible way imaginable imaginable. I am fighting a war for my son's development. Modern culture has been taken over by women and they do not get us. 
right? My wife, who is the most understanding woman in on the planet, does not quite get me sometimes. She doesn't get dudes sometimes. And it's because she's not one of us. How could she? She wouldn't know the depths of violence I am capable of because she's not bred for that, right? She just doesn't understand. And, and that's just one very, very specific example, but it's something that comes up or like a lot. They just don't understand. So the best case is that cultures run by women who don't get us. Worst case is that they're actually actively trying to feminize men. And that is happening. And it's been confirmed in maybe not everywhere, but it's been confirmed in places, right? This is not just modern sentiment. There's actual marketing material out there. And they are selling this hard cover of the, of the time magazine this month, the issue, the world's most influential people, the cover Prince Harry and his wife, Megan. Now, this couldn't be a more beta picture if they had tried any harder. And I say that because we know that they did. Okay. Now, take a look at this. For those who aren't watching, I'll describe it. All right. We've got the Duchess or, I don't know, is it just his wife? I mean, I forget if she gets the honorifics anymore. It sounds like she was supposed to give those up. But let's be honest. Everybody's still calling her Duchess. All right. So the Duchess of Sussex, Megan, is standing in like this white pantsuit with like this very casual top. All right. Her hair is flowing over both shoulders and she's staring intently right into the camera with an almost an almost smile on her face. Now sitting right behind her clad in all black, like the exact opposite cut of this woman, stage left and clutching his wife is Prince Harry. Now, he's staring directly at the camera as well, even more serious than she is. Even sitting, he's like of a height with her, but it's the clutching that I just can't stop. I, I don't know whether to laugh or to like grit my teeth. You guys are seeing one of them. It's like he's literally hiding behind his wife, like hiding from the scorn of the British populace. Like this is the guy really we made a big deal about this guy. He continues to allow these decisions to be made for him. And I think that that's the thing that gets that, that that's the thing I have trouble with. Right. I doubt that even he is beta enough to be concocting these ideas on his own. Right. I'm telling you, this was designed to put his wife in front of him as the more influential of the two. Right. Magic lady bitch that changed the course of the British Royal line forever. Now, this photo is like the woke wet dream of the photograph or the photography industry. It's absolutely crazy. Again, Prince Harry's folly is that he's allowing this to happen to him, right? It can't feel fulfilling to have someone spending your political capital in the amounts that his wife is putting herself on this pedestal the way that she has over the past couple of years. It is, it is astounding to watch. I, 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 I started paying attention to this more and more often because for the life of me, I cannot understand how it happened, especially when they whine. Like all they want is privacy. Well, then say no to having your picture on the cover of Time magazine. Like you can't tell us that you don't want attention when everything you do is about gaining attention. And if your only source of income is the fact that people want, like, have an attention to you, then at least acknowledge your situation and don't whine about it, right? We're like, I, I don't like it. Doesn't pass the smell test. Don't try to make convince us otherwise. Just knock it off. Do the right thing. And to top that off, Harry, brother, you can project strength and. Still do what your wife asks you to. I mean, we do it all. The husbands do it all the time all over the country. I don't know how the Brits do it, but here in America, you can be the man and still do what your wife wants you to. Like you could still pursue her dreams and retain your masculinity, right? Like the British people should be pissed at, at Prince Charles. Like, the, like 
Harry's dad for failing to outline this point. You don't need to prostrate yourself like this. Cowering behind your wife on the cover of Time Magazine is not a good look, dude. Especially for someone who with any chance of becoming king. Right? He's falling farther and farther behind, but like, dude is the next, he was the, he's the next link. Right? Like, it's not a good look. Now, this, this next situation, again, we're going to rifle through some of these. This next situation is not even my test of manhood, but somebody thought that they could challenge a real king. The king. Boy, you done f***ed up. My father is the king. He is a, a great patriarch with a big sphere of responsibility. I proudly consider myself his duke, capable of holding my own territory, but obviously part of this guy's kingdom. Now, one thing you should realize, if you are worried about messing with me, I got nothing on my father. Anyway, I got a text from my mother this past week telling me to call my father immediately because he has gotten into a physical altercation and that the cops are involved and now after the fact i think that she was a maybe a little light on the details when she called me but let's set let's set the stage my father is an aggressive driver and i and i say that because he's got a premium sports car and drives it like he's not scared to be buried in this thing all right we've made peace with that that this is not a new a new phenomenon Okay, I, I'm more of a truck guy, like far more torque over speed. I am not a, uh, I'm not a sports car guy, right? And I've tried to keep up, not going to happen. So this has led to a few situations in the past where people don't appreciate my father's driving. Well, this time it got physical. This guy pulls up behind my father and my uncle who's in the passenger seat. My father is 5'11", 275 pounds, easy. Now, my uncle is probably, I don't know, well, let's say 5'6 and probably 150. Now, I don't know what this guy's dimensions are, but I do know that if that he did exit the vehicle with a yellow wrench in hand and he intended to use it as a bludgeon, all right? This guy's going to use this as a club. Now, one, I'm thinking this guy was at, with was like of a size with my father because of the weapon of choice, a mechanic of some sort, because, given the wrench, that was big enough to use as a club. And we're not usually, mechanics aren't usually slight people, right? Now the wrench needed to be big enough to pose a threat or the guy wouldn't have picked it up. Now that lends itself to like a pipe wrench or a pry bar, especially because my dad described it as yellow. And believe it or not, there's not a lot of yellow tools out there. All right. The ones I know of are pipe wrenches, which are big or pry bars, which are, are meant to destroy stuff. So either way, bad situation. Now, my father grew up in a rough neighborhood back in the seventies and eighties. Now, needless to say, he knows how to throw down hell. Like my uncle did too. Like that's these, that's what these guys are. Now, when my dad took the brunt of the attack, my uncle did a perfect job. Now, anyone listening who finds themselves in a situ similar situation, in a hand-to-hand -hand situation like this, the first tactical objection or objective is to control the weapon. Now, my father's more of a brawler, and as long as he can keep the guy from swinging effectively, he can still do damage from the front. But if you're in a knife fight, that's a different situation, not a club. In a knife fight... Every tactical instructor out there is going to tell you, you control the knife, especially if it's like you're not, like it's your just hands and this guy's wielding a blade. You control the knife first. All right. Because that's the thing that's going to get you. And given the size difference between my father and my uncle, my father needs to be able to throw punches. Like that's his benefit. Seeing this, my uncle actually goes around the car and, and gra grabs, flanks the guy Wrap, wraps up the wrench arm, enabling my father to end things. Now, my father let the guy drive off after taking a bit of a beating, right? But this could have ended very, very differently. You don't with the king, all right? 
And hats off to my uncle for being down to ride and executing perfectly. Thank you, Uncle Mitch, for supporting my father. Now, gentlemen, this situation is exactly why I am always armed. Right? Not for throwing hands at some dude. That's that's not what this was. This guy came, this guy exited the car first. This, this guy came at my father with a weapon. He was not playing around. This guy was in it to do damage. Had my father been alone and unarmed, that situation may have gone in a very different direction. Now, my father isn't a man to be messed with like that from a purely objective standpoint, so I'm confident, but this world is anything but certain. All right? I don't put myself myself in situations like that. Someone comes at me with a wrench with a wrench like that, I can meet force with force at the very least. I'm in shape enough to throw down for more uh, for more than an extended brawl where most dudes have in their in themselves at any given time maybe 10 seconds of intense fist fighting before they're spent. I'd rather prepare for a situation like that than be caught unprepared in a situation that could have turned out this badly like my father did in real life just this week. I got to admit, I think I prepare for too many situations, truly. If I weren't wired to do this, I'd crumble. Even, even I find it over the top sometimes. I took my family on a cheap vacation uh, since we last aired. You know, we went down to the Atlantic coast with some friends and the boys got to see the ocean for the first time. Great. Well, we've mentioned on this show before, fathers die in the ocean all the time. Now, it's mostly from a lack of awareness, but they die, often in the attempts of saving somebody else. Going to this private beach, I knew we weren't likely to have like a lifeguard on hand. If you guys remember or have been to the ocean before, a lot of times at like a very public beach, they'll have these white towers that'll be spaced out and there'll be lifeguards just watching. Awesome. Now to watch over an area and go and they're there to go out and watch after people and dive in if things get weird. Now I've prepared my family for riptides. We've caught, you know, you you get caught in a riptide and you get dragged out to sea. Remember, you do not fight it. Swim laterally. To the, like side to side, do not swim towards the beach. If you're on the shore and you see someone get caught in a riptide, you are meant to toss in something that floats and the current should take that flotation device out to the, to them. You know, it's not a, not a big thing for them to kind of float there and wait for the top current to bring out something that floats, all right? Now, given how I have two kids of a swimming age without the endurance for much water survival. My job is to ensure their safety. No lifeguard means I have, I have to have the means to save my children who I would die for. And I'm, I'm a pretty strong swimmer, but if, but in my children, I, you know, I'm, I'm primarily concerned for, right? Like I'm not worried about me dying out there. I'm worried about them like failing. Now, not wanting to put myself in a situation where I fail like this and drown and, you know, in the process of carrying my two kids to shore, I took precautions. Now, do not, I I love you guys, but do not judge me, okay? I bought a Baywatch safety can, okay? Now, that's the red buoy that looks like a suitcase. If you've ever seen the show or the movie, I bought this because it's meant to be pulled on the cord that's strapped around your chest so that you can swim at full speed while you drag it out to sea with you to rescue someone, right? Now, more importantly, it's got handholds that my sons like would have very little trouble letting go of. I mean, they'd like easy handholds to grab. I, I've got, I got the bigger ones so it could hold both of them and float with me on it if need be. Now, I, it looks dorky. Don't, don't judge me. Right now, but, but the greater point is I just struggled to, like whether or not to buy this. I mean, I, I want to say that this was a reasonable precaution, no lifeguard, which was the correct assumption upon getting to the beach. Like that was a good decision on my part, like or a good observation. They probably wouldn't have one. Now, what flotation device could I count on? Right. The boogie boards would have sunk or had gotten lost in the pursuit. Like they didn't hold much weight. 
and I've tried them. And now I, so I was split like 50, 50, the chances that your kids actually get caught in a riptide are, are they are greater than 0%, but with a little diligence, you should be able to spot them. So spend the money or satisfy my anxiety. You know, you know what I mean? Like, or, you know, be anxious or spend the money. Like I, I, I was torn. Now, like I mentioned, ultimately I did end up getting this buoy. The rationale was that if the situation did arise, there wasn't going to be much in the way of devices that could like that, that, I, that we could throw in, you know? So providing ourselves the material, that material was prudent in and of itself. Like we weren't going to have a pool float bed thing that you see people laying on like that. You don't bring those to the beach. Like there's not a lot that floats that you're, that you're going to be with. You know, even more so, you can use that. We, we thought, hey, we'll use this buoy to teach the boys how to swim because it's designed to be held out like in front of your arms like Superman. And you're supposed to hold on to this thing and you can swim behind it. And it can allow you to you know, develop your, your swimming kick and your form, right? Now, little added benefit, when I did the test run with the device to get used to it, I came like running out of the ocean, very dramatic. Like it was all for fun. I was being silly. But as I was running up, my middle child saw me. Clark saw me and he takes off running at me, you know, like from the camp that was at like the back of the beach. So I kind of scooped him up and continued to run, like carrying this little suitcase thing. And as I get to the, to our, our umbrella and tent and all that stuff we had, my wife is just there with the camera and she's just click, 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 just just clicking pictures uh, and she winked at me and said that, that those were for later. So proof positive if I've ever seen one. Good decision, right? But some things that continue to test men are the people around them, right? Like my family, I mean, that's what we made that decision for. But moving forward, sometimes it's other men asserting their control over situations, right? That's another test that we go through. Sometimes it's a woman or even a stranger, or like either a stranger or a loved one who doesn't understand masculinity. In business, 99% of the test that you're going to have to your masculinity is going to be from your employees. All right? So right after I got back from this vacation, I launch a project at work. Now it's a TPM deep clean, which consists of disassembling a piece of equipment down to its frame, cleaning everything, identifying everything that's broken or in need of an update and rebuilding it with as many new corrections as we can manage. Now, this is the business's seventh deep clean and the process has yet to be agreed on. Now, there's always a tweak or two or improvements to be made, but there's also 2020 and 2021 have been crazy business years from people, labor, uh, training standpoints, there's been a ton of new industry developments in this time, and they've all been reactionary. I've never experienced anything like it in my in my career before. But any business will test your principles. Now, be ready to compromise on any sort of these things in your career. Okay, you're you're going to compromise on a lot. Now, believe me, it's harder than it looks, particularly when you're asked to compromise on critical factors or on the basic functions of a process, especially when the people who are, who are resisting are sim simultaneously telling you to stick to your principles, right? Like mixed messages from any level suck the life out of you as an employee or as an employer. They, I mean, they really do like be just watching us make decisions like this can sometimes be grating. All right. Now, I say that employees themselves provide a very different challenge. Now, I try extremely hard to maintain the assumption of positive intent. As a manager, this is critical. The assumption that people around you mean well allows you the capacity to follow through on a process. Okay? Employee makes a mistake. Assume there was a reason. Investigate objectively and let the investigation prove that the person knew better and decided to do X or Y incorrectly on purpose. If you're good enough, the, 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 the process will prove itself out, 
right? This maintains your object objectivity, which will save you in the long run. Like during this exercise, I had two such situations. Now, one where an employee showed up like four hours late, you know, to his credit, we normally change the hours with a month's notice to have everybody working from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Now, that way, second and first shift folks can actually work together, learn together in the same time frame. They get the same experience. It's meant to build consensus. But moreover, this gentleman has gone through this process before, and he kind of knows how the hours work. So his excuse for everything was that he, the schedule said that he was only changed, like they only changed his hours for the last two days of the exercise. Well, all right. Well, we proved that that thing was wrong pretty quickly. Like all the supervisors were asked, the schedule was posted and we pulled that historic document and it said the hours that he was supposed to be working and he just failed. And like every pointing to this guy just forgetting that he had to do this project and made up some BS excuse. Awesome. Right? So he's going to get an attendance violation. And if I think I know this guy's situation, he may be terminated soon. All right? Now, here's where the test comes in. Every single employee begs for mercy in this situation. And they try to get you to empathize, which you have to do to an extent. Empathy is a great thing. It, you know, it's something that is needed for you to foster good relations. But for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, it means it's, it's your ability to see something from another person's perspective and actually feel some of what they should be feeling in the situation. It's the embodiment of walking in somebody else's shoes. There's a distinction here that we must make. Similar to Prince Harry, you can empathize without submitting to the point. Okay, in fact, that's half of the whole, that's the whole point of having empathy is being able to feel it and still make a decision. You know, feeling for the employee and giving into that demand that they have, you know, like, do, they, do not, they don't have a cause and effect relationship. Giving in actually encourages empathy in one direction, theirs. Now, I've put things on the employee before, asking them to empathize with my situation. Hey, what would you do if you were in my situation? If you were a manager and you dealt with this, what would you do? Right? Now, as a rule, I will give you this advice for free, right? If you have to, if you decide to use that line, make sure it's rhetorical. Like you don't ex don't actually expect them to give you words as an a as an answer. They never answer the way it needs to be. All right. They either use it to their advantage, or they actually have no experience to lead them to the right answer that you're going to end up doing. Right. Only with the most honest of employees does that line ever work or lead to compromise. So use it sparingly. But every employee does ask for mercy, and that's this 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 eats at this eats at you. Now, this is where supervisors and managers do get a little jaded. We can't empathize, but we need to maintain a somewhat uniform standard for all employees. Otherwise, we it would we would have mo a modicum of chaos in the in the system. Now, even worse, when you bend rules for some and not others, because the second situation doesn't allow for as much freedom as the first situation would have, where you did bend the rules. Like, let's say there's a legit reason you can't bend this time. It's still going to be viewed as discrimination between one employee and the other, and that will come back to trouble you. I would know. Now, we become jaded because at some point, you stop caring, all right? Now, we need to, as managers, we need to fight this hard. Also, I'm meant to empathize with someone who, you know, I mean, why, why, why? this is why I'm jaded or people get jaded, right? Like, I'm meant to empathize with someone who's flagrantly decided to ignore their instructions and reminders, had enough of an attendance problem that they were on the cusp of getting fired for it at the beginning, like before this incident even happened and only seems to care now that a decision needs to be made. That's a hard line to hold, right? Like you just like you, I mean, it's hard to empathize with that guy. 
Now, in these situations, you hold the line. It is far better to lose a bad employee than keep a good like than keep one. Right? Not that everybody in the situation is a bad egg, but my company has a pretty loose attendance pol- policy as it is. So if you're on the bubble, I have zero sympathy. Now, during exercises like mine, where where we're operating under a tight timeline, this becomes difficult. On top of that, these employees don't report directly to me. You know, they're operators who just report, who otherwise report to an operations supervisor. Now, this means that I have to maintain a standard where the supervisor doesn't necessarily agree in some cases. You know, but I'm a manager, so what's what's going to happen? They're going to send their manager to get involved, and he's going to come talk me down. Right now, these situations test you; they test your resolve. If handled improperly, you can gain a reputation for being aggressive, where you're really just trying to do your job. Now, this figure is going to help navigate situations like this, right? Especially if you're a 6'1", 235-pound dude, this tool can help you maintain the right balance between soft and firm. Now, on your screen, you can see this table. Now, I'll describe it for those of you who are listening. It's a it's a two-by-three table. On one side, the categories are person and issue, top to bottom. Across the top... The columns are labeled passive, assertive, and aggressive, respectfully. Now, in the middle, you can see a spectrum. There are only two words across the entire body of of this table, soft and firm. You can see in the first column, we've got passive, which is the tone that you're setting. You set a passive tone when you are soft on the person, while being soft on the issue. Now, I hope that tracks. Now, on the opposite side of the table, you have aggressive. Now, from the University of Minnesota Library, aggression is behavior that is intended to harm another person who doesn't wish to be harmed. Now, the problem with this objective definition is that intended, quote unquote, is actually a relative, it's, it's a relatively subjective term, okay? I mean, how many times have you experienced a child crying over about over or about what some other kid did to them? You know, you try to explain, you hear about it, you try to explain to the kid that's crying that, you know, your brother didn't mean it, and the kid cries, yes, they did. Well, exactly, right? It's totally subjective, right? Agre- like, did, did, I, did he intend me harm? Yes, he did. No, he didn't. It's, it's all a matter of opinion. Now, this is a natural pitfall that we can't really avoid, right? We could do things to dampen the effects by treading carefully and maintaining positive intent. But according to the figure on the screen, you know, you can see that to be aggressive, you must be firm on both the issue and the person. Right now, recognize the subject heading isn't violent. It's just aggressive. Okay. Hey, we are holding the line here and you are going to hold the line. <laughs> like those, that sentence right there is aggressive. Okay. Now in the middle, you have assertive, which as a leader, this is what you want. Assertion is the ability to hold the line and to present your will in a way that will stand up to challenge in good faith. Now, if you don't have good faith between you and the and the person who's challenging you, your principal defense to their challenge will be perceived as aggressive and you'll accomplish little or nothing. Like that's why I recommend that you disengage from those who do not wish to work with you in good faith. Like there will never be a moment where you're not seen as aggressive rather than just assertive. Okay. Now to be properly assertive, you must make an effort to be firm on the issue, yet soft in the person. Empathy helps here. You'll say, I understand that it's hard to do X and Y, but you've been doing this same exercise for months now. You've been trained. You've been doing the job well thus far. If there are improvements that we need to make to this process, we can certainly look into that. But for right now, 
this mistake happened and you're, you're being given this documented coaching outlining that we've discussed, the, discussed this. Now, if the person resists that statement, you can rehash certain points in the form of questions. Did this and this happen? I mean, you have, I mean, you have proof of what happened. So the answer is either is going to be obvious to you when you ask that question. But if the employee gives you a falsehood, then you say, then why does this proof show otherwise? What am I not seeing? Right? Employees sometimes go through these motions in order to get away with something like weak supervisor, and they are weak. Make no mistake about it. Weak supervisors don't thoroughly investigate things and they make corrections to the record without cause. I can't tell you how many times you can go into any timekeeping software and see where supervisors are just correcting things. Why? Because it keeps the peace, right? It's little effort on the employee to ask for, to just say, Hey, I have a BS excuse. And it's very easy. It's very little effort on the leader, you know, but you end up with a crazy lack of discipline amongst the employees and little respect to get from them as well. So for all, all those reasons, I recommend that you hold the line. It is not worth it. Now, to me, in the past couple of weeks, this happened multiple times over the course of just a four-day exercise. And it happened like multiple days. Like each time was a test of resolve. My wish to keep the peace, and it was a test of my patience. Now, kids will test you in many ways. Now, sometimes it's it's your patience. Now, sometimes it's just seeing your principles on display and asking you to reinforce them for yourself. Now, my boys love going down to this, to some creeks and we go uh, hopping from like rock to rock as the water flows around them, right? It's like the floor is lava, but just way cooler, right? Now, I got my oldest to do this successfully when he was four. My middle is just going through the first paces at this. So last weekend, we went through the motions. I took all the boys down to the creek, which was flowing pretty decently. Now, my wife came down, baby number three in hand. Now, little Glenn was an absolute rock star. Clark, eh, needed some help. But again, it was his first time out, so we weren't taking this, like, super serious. Like, we weren't, like, hurting him. Or not hurting him, but we weren't, like, judging. <laughs> I figured out how to say that, right? Now, now with kids... There's a trial and error period, but there's also structured learning, which we know I'm good at. Now, knowing that this, you know, that the evening is going to be toast if everyone gets soaked. I mean, I did my best to instruct first and then let the boys kind of have at it. Now, when I taught little Glenn, the experience was much more one-on-one, -on -one, which he thrived at. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to do that or spend as much time with Clark because I got everybody around us think I've got, you know, I've got to give little Glenn direction from 10 feet out. He's in front of me. Don't go that way. Turn there, et cetera. Right now I've got mom and baby who are five or six feet behind me. And I'm trying to trailblaze for my wife and point out slippery spots so that, you know, where, where she might tank it baby in hand. Right. I, I, I can need her to be stable. Now, Sometimes we got into spots where I had to take the baby with me. Now he's walking a bite, like a bite unsteadily, but he's easily, he's easy to handle. He's just heavy. So imagine me with the baby backpack on football, carrying my giant one-year-old and leading another child by the hand rock to rock as the river flows around us. Now I understand that, you know, like, that the idea was for us to kind of be in this situation, but you're always being observed by others, right? Masculinity isn't a skill that you activate when you need it. It's something that you are. Now, people around you, especially kids, will see this and they'll see either its presence or its absence and they'll look for it. They're like, I don't see this. Where? Where is it? Or they see it and they're like, oh, I want to see more of that. Right. So as my ability to multitask is being tested, you know, my family climbs along this formation to find ourselves at a relative impasse. Like the water's too wide for the kids to cross, much less my wife with baby in hand. So here comes dad. 
Now I shed the baby bag. Mom is already holding the little one. So I crossed the gap. I took like two leap, like I leap of faith it to one rock and then another. And then the last bound, I'm at the creek bed where it's, it's, we're still in the creek, but it's shallow enough not to be overrun by the current, right? So there's a litany of rocks, right? Both big and small around me. My boys are looking at me like, okay, now what's he going to do? Well, I made them a bridge. Right now, this is where deadlifting comes into play in real life. Gentlemen, if you're at the gym, here it goes, right? Your reason to curl, baby and arm. I, I can stand here and curl to your chest, you know, a 30-pound baby for 40-plus minutes. It's hell on your arms, but that's a reason to curl. That's a reason to do your upper body, all right? Building, br- building bridges out of rock, uh, out of rocks in creeks is why you deadlift. Okay. Now from the ground, I picked up rocks that were the size of my chest. All right, and probably as thick as a loaf of bread. All right. Now heaving these things and making my way to the shore, I like hurled them into the water. Like rock here, two rocks there, and they start forming this makeshift path over the water. Now, at one point, I'm like holding one of these boulders, and I'm hopping from rock to rock out into the water to drop it in the last gap, like on the furthest stone from the edge. Now, after dropping the last rock and providing my family a way forward, my wife came up to me to tell me about something that my son Clark, the middle, had said. So as I tossed the last, the last boulder, he looked up at my wife and said, daddy's great. And like tested and passed. Like the test that you don't know is happening is often the one that you fail, right? Another test of masculinity passed and the observer, the, someone who needed it the most, right? My developing two-year-old. And what's better, again, the auditor of the test was my wife who's watching my sons just like soak in this masculinity. It's been nothing but positive for our relationship as well. Now, the last test that we're going to talk about today is a big one. Now, you're going to hear a lot of swearing in this one because this makes me furious, right? To no end, okay? This has been... One of the biggest tests of my character in a long time. Uh, and it's, it's still still f- frustrating. Now, this has tested my beliefs, my principles, my resolve. It's tested my marriage. This all sounds like it could be building into something weird. No, you guys have heard about this already. No, I don't have some big announcement for you guys. But I want to put this in perspective. This isn't hyperbole. I'm not doing this to be dramatic. Okay? President... Joe Biden, I, I will never comprehend the people who voted for this puppet. Okay, creepy Uncle Joe is, quote, losing his patience. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's not with the litany of women that this guy has turned down because he just, <laughs> he likes to sniff them, right? No, he's not losing his patience with them. He's loosening his patience with us. Those of us who have chosen to wait out this experimental period with the COVID-19 vaccine is going through rather than be a free guinea pig for big pharma. All right. Now, since we've aired, Joe Biden has engaged in the largest shell game I've ever been aware of in government in my entire life. Joe Biden in an an address to the people. Stated that through executive order, he's going to direct OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, to issue emergency guidance requiring private employers, i.e. people who aren't controlled by the government, with more than 100 employees to require vaccination of every employee on the rosters. The loophole is that outside of vaccination, you can opt to get tested for COVID once every week and that the employers can pass that cost on to their employees. Now, for federal contractors, there is no such loophole. The Biden administration 
has never quite passed the smell test, but this one could be smelled with a di from a distance. Like for us, it's a couple thousand miles. Now, the sheer nerve of this puppet president and his ghost administration to further divide this country and threaten hardworking Americans who have yet to be persuaded to be injected with an experimental vaccine that will provide limited immunity from COVID for just a few months, I, I, I can't fathom that. Right now, let me be clear. I'm happy the vaccine exists. For those who are at an increased risk of harmful side effects if exposed to COVID, I'm glad that there's something. If you haven't had it already, I, I'm glad that there's something that, that's protecting you. That's not what I'm getting at. However, you do not hear anything from the government overlords with uh, about increased development of therapeutics, like the things that can keep people alive when they catch it, especially if it's as contagious as they say. Why not? Now, you'd think with this new Delta variant out there and now like the Mu variant that's out, that getting people like getting people who are sick, you know, their vaccines, like you'd be working on an option to be faster and more effective at treatment. Right? We've already gotten a vaccine that will at a very minimum reduce the effects, which sounds like BS. But no, deadliest virus in the history of the world, but the government won't allow us to try every treatment. Hydroxychloroquine was dropped like a hot stone once President Trump endorsed it. Ivermectin has been mentioned in the past couple of weeks, and that seems to be going nowhere. But, you know, like th these people are, are taking their message as seriously as a first grade spelling test. Now, first, do the vaccines work? Yes or no? If you think they do, then why are you worried about me? And I mean that seriously. You cannot possibly care more about my personal health than I do. So I ask again, what in the f are you worried about me for? The next answer is always, well, you could spread it to those around you. Now, if they're vaccinated and you think the vaccine works, then what's the problem? For those who don't understand this point, it's quite easy. For men, personal responsibility is a cornerstone to being a complete adult. Women, it's a little different, but it's not much. Like Personal responsibility is the thing of the future, right? Villages are disappearing, and we're looking at a far more globalized society. That changes things a bit because people you don't know – cannot have your best interest at heart or know what's best for you and your family, yet they think they have the, the moral obligation to, to talk. And that's all it is. It's talk. Now, the important piece is that we take reasonable precautions on our own behalf. That's a personal responsibility. Knowing that, if I decide that the side effects of the vaccine are riskier than the chances that I actually get COVID and then get severe symptoms, that decision is on me and I'm comfortable. Right? Remember, I've been working on site this whole time since this started. I've got a lot of COVID stories to tell, tell you from firsthand people. Now, I'll tell you, no one gives two that I was on site for all that time. No one cared that I had to shop at Walmart and get supplies for my family. Like, do what you need to, right? Like, that's what we were told. Do what you have to. Wear this cloth napkin over your face and hope for the best. Well, now there's a vaccine out there that's only good for a few months. Now, I don't like subscribing to a Razor subscription for $1 a month, canceled at any time. If I can't, if I don't do that, then why would I be comfortable getting another experimental injection every quarter as they tweak this? Now, the other option is this, number two, they don't think it works. Now, that brings us right to the question, right to the point. Then why are you injecting yourself with it? Moreover, if you admit that you don't think it works, then why are you trying to jab me with it? Right? 
Joe and his crew have been patient, but their patience is wearing thin. <laughs> I mean, he actually said that. For those who didn't see the speech, it is very, like, mob bossy, very, like, hey, we're going to do what we need to now. Like, your time is up. Like, normal Americans actually care about how the president feels about us. Right? In the most Weinstein-esque statement I've ever heard, the, pre the president is actually resorting to coercion. Right? Listen to these next few words. Now, try to disconnect yourself from the angry podcast host that's actually saying them. Just hear them objectively. I'm going to put this inside you. There's no going back after it's done. Now, if, if you, don't, you don't feel like it, well, that's too bad. If you don't let me stick this in you, you won't be able to feed your family or pay your bills. If you don't let me do this to you, I can ruin you. Sounds a bit rapey, doesn't it? Now, I don't know how they thought that it could not sound rapey. I mean, think about it. Sexual consent is completely void if it's done under coercion or duress. Our parents taught us back in the 90s that predators might try and lure us into windowless vans with candy and treats or puppies. You know, they told us, then they told us that they often threatened their victims with violence towards their friends and family if they were to come out and tell anybody who could actually help them. Now, how is this any different if Joe is holding us hostage in order to, uh, to get people to take his sugar water in injection? I shouldn't be too shocked that Joe is good at rapey language. Like people consider the likes of you and me to exhibit toxic masculine behavior. But this guy is the truly toxic amongst us. Like do me a favor, Google Joe Biden sniffing search, and then just go to images and you'll be awakened to all the weird interaction Joe has with women of all ages. And in fact, for your viewing pleasure, I'm going to actually post two YouTube video links in the show description today so you can just watch this happen in real time. Joe is an absolute creep, all right? He'd be good at this type of relationship. Kamala probably doesn't have a problem with any of this either. I mean, she had an extended affair with a married speaker of the California Assembly, Willie Brown, Right, who started her career in politics for her and gave her promotions and preferential treatment because she was sleeping with him. And he has said this in interviews. Like that's the only reason. So someone who was who was likely tugging on at least one of Joe Biden's strings has no problem getting something injected into her as long as she's getting something in return. So why would she be concerned about the little people and their little jobs? It certainly should be, you know, just as, I mean, we should be as crafty and ambitious as her, right? So much for the Me Too movement. Now, this feels like rape, right? Now, my role for my family is as a provider. I am the king of my household. Never before have outside factors like this completely outside of my control threatened to derail my career or destabilize my household. Something as flimsy as these vaccines. Now, remember, I work for a federal contractor in, in some, some cases. I'm, I'm not going to be given this option to get tested or I would take it, right? And for those who say, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's for the good of us. COVID is not polio. COVID is not smallpox. Like this is, it's either deadly to old people or people with pre-existing conditions it's wildly inconsistent and you might, you might have no symptoms. You might have severe symptoms. You might not know at all that you've ever had it. So no, it's not the same thing. I've talked to my wife about this. No, God sent me this angel of a woman for this, you know, for, to me. Like she was sickened by this announcement. Now she doesn't want me to get it either. And believe me, I am the only one in my family getting this, getting this vaccine if it's absolutely necessary. And with all the side effects that are landing people in the hospital, especially young kids, 
My family is far safer not getting the vaccine than they are of actually getting COVID. And there are actually statistics out there that will tell you that. But my wife is my customer at the end of the day. I'm the single income for the entire household. Knowing that, my wife agreed that we will explore every option before getting the jab, particularly when it's being forced on us in this way. She knows everything that I would be giving up if I did this. I'd be compromising a principle that I hold particularly dear. I won't do things for you that you wouldn't even consider for yourself. I have too many people that I love and work with on a daily basis. If you aren't even willing to try taking care of yourself, my efforts will be wasted on you. Now, my children deserve that time and attention if if you're just going to squander it. Now, getting the vaccine in this manner is conceding this point, right? I'll get it on behalf of the community because, I mean... You know, I have a responsibility to them, right? That's actually true, right? We do have responsibility to those around us. However, if if it, you know, this isn't where the buck stops. If people are that concerned and they think that this works, then they should get the free shot that's available everywhere. I'm not stopping them. Now, second, I'd be accepting Joe's advances for money. Now, for my children's livelihood in some cases, believe me, I'm not above violence. But if somebody came to me and personally and laid this situation at my feet, they would be broken in front of me at the very least. And if somebody did this to my wife, they'd be dead. It's legal to slay a rapist. Now, don't quit on me now, okay? That statement to slay a rapist is 100% legally accurate, okay? If they're in the act of doing it or trying to. Okay. Now I'm not saying I'm going to go do something about creepy Joe, but the feeling of rage that is not unique to me was, is a completely predictable side effect of this whole thing. Now, if I caved and I let Joe do this to us or caved to that coercion through whatever coward intermediary that he decides, then where does this stop? It's not like the vaccine covers your immunity for years. Otherwise, I'd probably get it willingly, right? I'm healthy. I'm likely to survive the side effects. But no, this is going to be one shot after the other until they decide they don't want to want to have me on the hook. Drug dealers do the same thing. I'm like, again, I'm going to I'm probably going to survive the side effects of the of the the, uh, vaccine. Like likely. I don't get the flu vaccine. Why? Because every time I get it, I get the flu, right? But no, this is going to be one shot after the other. If we lose here, there's no going back. They'll declare a state of emergency whenever they want power and, and they'll dose us up and never let go of the reins. Now I told my wife that if I do decide to sacrifice myself for the family and in the absence of other options, I would. I am not going to be a pleasant person to be around. Right? Think of any sexual assault victim that you have out there. There are years of psychological issues that they'll be dealing with. This would be no different. Sacrificing your masculinity in a way like this is something that will haunt you, gentlemen. The emasculation of someone else having that much control over you and demanding that you break your own character. I mean, that emasculation is immense. To actually break yourself at their direction will take a heavy toll on you. And as I stated to my wife, I'm going to be a, I'm not going to be a pleasant guy to be around. And she said that she would be ready to help me recover from that should the time come. Now, in the meantime, the fight isn't over. All right, there's work to be done. I won't back down easily. I have a time frame to decide. Uh, And that I've set upon myself to decide if I'm going to move on myself and look for other options or, you know, to kind of help us maintain our, our standard of living or to insulate me from this mandate. Now, first step, use the political power that we have. I have contacted our, my congressman and his legislative director actually called me. So kudos. Now, during that conversation, she clarified 
Joe Biden getting on mic and saying that he's going to make these rules is not the same thing as signing the executive order. Now, what I'm worried about is something that happened just a few weeks ago. We lifted the mask mandate where I work. So the government stepped in. They said that the USDA will not operate in a facility without 100% mask requirement. So we went back because the USDA said that, that they wouldn't do their jobs without a concession from us. Another reason the government can go get Now, I'm concerned that they'll pull the same move here on a much more personal scale, regardless of the legalities. And the legalities here actually matter. And and it's because it's the only recourse we have, or that Congress has, to curb executive overreach. Uh, And and that's a lawsuit. And that, I mean, that's right. Right? In a normal organization, if someone steps outside the bounds of their authority, the people who actually have that the authority usually step in and tell a dude to calm down. You don't have the, the right to do this. In this situation, Congress won't do that. Right? They like the, it's it's led by the Democrats. They agree with this. So it would take the entire legislative body to do this. And with that, and so we're right now we're without help. Congress would need to pass a bill stating that the president is out at is out of line. Now, that's actually the point of the federal government, right? The point of the federal government is gridlock. It's 100% designed to be that way. Think about it. We were designed to stay relatively local, which is ultimately a better way for us anyway. My vote matters where I live. Voting locally allows the local culture to exercise power over a smaller location, usually pertaining to issues that actually affect us immediately. And my vote counts more because I may, I may be one of 25,000 voting locally where I'm one in 3 billion on the national level. So to keep things functioning that way, in order to pass laws that affect everyone, Congress has to be uncharacteristically united. We've lost sight of that, and the effects are starting to create fractures that cannot be mended. But ultimately, necessity is the mother of invention. I have backup plans that may be risky, but if a few things pan out the right way, I may be able to forge ahead in an even better situation than before. I I mean, I've pulled weirder situations out before like that, but again, I've got a lot riding on this. I've I've got a big family. That I love and I want to provide for them. So right now it's principles or my family, which is a tough, tough, it's a tough place to be. It's a tough place to navigate. For right now, I'm staying with the business until the dust settles. Pundits all over the DC Beltway are claiming correctly that this is probably a stalling move by Joe and team to distract from the disastrous Afghanistan withdrawal. All right. In either case, he chose the wrong way to mess with us. I urge everyone to make the best decision for yourself with the full knowledge of what you're doing. If you have a bad reaction to the vaccine or catch COVID, are the consequences worse than the person you'll be after compromising yourself? Now, I urge non-compliance en masse before walking out of work. All right? Just don't. What are they going to do? Test to see if they actually fire you, right? Otherwise, I mean, you're just going to quit. It's the same thing, right? Now, this is chess of the most dangerous type. Do not be a pawn. But more importantly, as players, do not take this feint. Joe is just talking at this point. He may be hoping to trigger a reaction from us that will actually benefit him in the long run. He's trying to move us from a relatively solid and fortified position. So stay the course until we know what's going on. I'll end this with a sentiment that's being chanted at rallies and at Alabama college games. Joe Biden. That's our show. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Glenn Kowalski. If you liked this episode, please follow and subscribe for free. We're on Apple podcast, YouTube, rumble, Spotify, and wherever else you get your content. Good luck out there.